good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Our text today is Romans chapter 1, and our theme is You Need the Gospel. But before we look at the text, we'd like to sing a couple of songs, songs that beautifully reflect the theme today. The first one, In Christ Alone, and the second, O Lord, I Need You. So would you join us in singing together this morning? Thank you. 
without you I fall apart And you're the one That guides my heart And Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you Where sin runs deep Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness Is Christ in me And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness Is Christ in me song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, meet together in this way again. Uh, We've thanked you often for the technology and the opportunities that it affords to us. We pray that today as we open your word that your spirit would not be bound in any way by our distance this morning, but in your omnipresent power that you'd gather with each one of us, gather us together in your spirit, help us to worship you today in spirit and in truth. And I pray, Father, that you'd open our eyes to your word today and incline our hearts to your word, unite our hearts around it and with one another, and help us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 1 in your Bibles this morning 
I have a good doctor. He listens to me. He considers my symptoms. And once in a while, when needed, he pulls out this little pad of paper. He scribbles something barely legible and tells me to take it to the pharmacy. He has written me a prescription. You have probably been given a prescription before. To prescribe is to set down a rule or direction. In this case, to advise a medicine or a form of treatment. Now, the Apostle Paul was a doctor of sorts, not only academically, though he certainly was. By today's educational standards, Paul would have had a doctorate. But he was a doctor in practice, to be sure. Not in the medical field. Paul was a doctor of the soul. He was trained in what we might call soul care. He knew what people needed on the inside of them that was not skin, organs, and blood. Luke was the medical doctor. And the physical life does matter. But so does the soul. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the outward man is perishing while the inward is being renewed day by day. This letter to the Romans is a 16-chapter prescription for the soul. Now, you may recall from past studies that Paul had made three missionary tours. On the last one, he visited Corinth And he was on his way to Jerusalem following a northern route to visit some other churches. He had visited Corinth. He was on his way to Jerusalem. He stopped up near Philippi, according to Acts chapter 20, and he wrote two letters. One was the second letter to the church at Corinth, and the other letter was a letter to the church at Rome. Now, if you have ever studied your maps of Paul's missionary journeys, and you know a little bit about geography, you would note that Paul's journeys never went that far west. Paul never made it to Rome in any of his missionary journeys. Not having been to Rome, how did that church get there? So before we start this survey of this prescription, we ask the question, how did that church start? We know it was the church in Rome because of chapter 1, verse 7, to all who are in Rome. To answer the question of how that church started, we actually have to go back between the Testaments. That is, between the Old and New Testament. The Jews were being persecuted, and as a result of their persecution, they were being dispersed. We call it the diaspora or the dispersion. Some of the Jews were pushed as far west as Rome. Once Jewish people gathered in a particular spot, they would establish a synagogue so they could continue their practice of observing faith in God. Once in a while, some of those Jews would travel back to Jerusalem. According to Acts chapter 2, verse 10, there were visitors in Jerusalem from Rome on the day of Pentecost. And according to this particular passage, they heard Peter's message on that day. Now, if you look back at that sermon in Acts chapter 2, Peter used the Old Testament passages that the Jewish people would have been well-versed in. And he talked about the miracles of Jesus. He talked about the suffering of Jesus. He talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And if you look at that passage just quickly in Acts chapter 2, this is what happened. Remember, these are Jewish people from Rome in Jerusalem. Now listen to this. Peter said in the end of his sermon, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, or King Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off and as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, these folks that heard this message on Pentecost went back to their home. Where was their home? Rome. And when they got there, they apparently told their fellow Jewish family and friends what had happened and that the Christ had come as the Old Testament prophets had declared. And what happened was a church was born. They believed the scriptures. They believed in Jesus Christ. They were born again. They received the Holy Spirit and all without apostolic assistance. I guess God can do his work without official clergy and official missionaries. Now, this wasn't an ego buster for Paul. In verse 8, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all. Paul was happy when people came to Christ, and the people in Rome were believers. However, they still had room to grow. They had the Old Testament, but they had no New Testament. At the point of this writing of the letter to the Romans, that church had been in existence for about 25 years already. According to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, their faith had been spoken of throughout the whole world. In other words, everywhere Paul went where there were Christians, he heard about the church in Rome. You may remember that Aquila and Priscilla were from that particular church. And while that church was a strong church, they were in need of further instruction, and we all are. In fact, we all need the gospel. That's the prescription. Now you say, well, why did they need the gospel? They were already saved. They'd been saved for 25 years. Do people that are already saved need the gospel? Well, the short answer is, The reason we need the gospel is because it's more than a message about how to get to heaven when you die. Now that matters because we are all going to die from one thing or another and we should be ready. But there is so much more to the gospel than simply getting ready to die. Pastor Ironside put it this way in his book on Romans, quote, Romans is the gospel to saints rather than the gospel preached to sinners. In order to be saved, it is only necessary to trust in Christ. But in order to understand our salvation and thus get out of it the joy and blessing God intends to be our portion, we need to have the work of Christ unfolded to us. Now, I want to read that last part again. Because that's the essence of this. In order to understand our salvation and thus to get out of it the joy and blessing God intends, we need to have the work of Christ unfolded to us. And that is Romans. The gospel is the good news about eternal life or about divine quality of life. It's about how to obtain what we all crave but often seek through counterfeits. And frankly, we all need that. There are many temptations in our world to pursue something other than God and his life. Many other temptations that suggest we can find life in some way other than what God has prescribed. The prophet Jeremiah said they were cisterns carved out with our own hands that had cracks in the bottom of it. In other words, we work real hard to get something out of it, and yet there's nothing in it at the end of the day, and the cracks keep forming, and life keeps leaking away. We need the gospel. The gospel is the theme of this letter. Of course, it depends who you read, but it does seem obvious in the first 17 verses that Paul has a theme. 
that he's working on here. If you look in verse 1, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. In verse 9, he said, God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Verse 15 says, so as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. And in verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Four times in the first 17 verses, Paul mentions the gospel. Seems to me to be the principal theme of this letter. I preached through the book of Romans, verse by verse, in the year 2000. And it took me two and a half years or so to do that. That was 20 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long already. But back when I did that, I defined the gospel this way, that the gospel is the Father's provision of new life in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is the Father's provision of new life in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the contents of this letter have liberated people from sin and death and guilt and bondage. I'm thinking about people like St. Augustine and Martin Luther and John Calvin and millions of unnamed people who have experienced eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and found the principal content for that liberation in this letter to the Romans. We could take years going through this letter, and it would not be enough time, but we're going to take a few months to survey it, and hopefully it will give you a framework for your own pursuit of life, for I know that that is what you want, and that is what your soul craves. Now, what does the gospel contain? Well, it's more than what I'm about to say today, but it contains five things that I'd like to address this morning from these introductory verses. First of all, it contains the fulfillment of Old Testament promises. Look in verses 2 through 4. The gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You notice, concerning, it says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, the Old Testament promises are fulfilled chiefly in a person. The Old Testament promises are fulfilled chiefly in a person. The gospel contains a proclamation concerning who that person is and what he has done. Now, who is he? Well, as to his human nature, he is of the seed of David. He's human. A fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. You can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. As to his divine nature, he is the one-of-a-kind Son of God. Psalm 110 is an Old Testament example to that. He is, the, as you read that passage in, in Psalm 110, the Father, the Lord, says to my Lord. That is, Jehovah says to my Lord, David is writing. David was able to see this, this Trinitarian conversation going on, and the Father said to the Son, sit at my feet till I make your enemies our footstool. David observed that. We had this, this connection between father and son that were there. This idea that there is a trinity, a, 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 a multiplicity to the Godhead. He is, Jesus is great David's greater son. And of course, all of that was a bit of a mystery until Jesus came along. But as to his divine nature then, we understand that he is the son of God. This was confirmed by the resurrection. 
He was crucified, of course, for our sins, but he was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit's power. That's what it means, spirit of holiness, in verse number four. He was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit, and this was the declarative stamp from God as to the nature and character of Jesus Christ. You may recall other people that died were revivified. That is, they were brought back to life only to die again. Jesus Christ experienced the first true resurrection, raised to life never to die again, raised to life and glorified as the first fruits, as the one who made the path for all who believe in following his resurrection. Now, verse 2 is why people will often say that the whole Old Testament points to Christ. This is the reason, or the lesson, I should say, that the people on the road to Emmaus learned when Jesus, where it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, that couple on the road to Emmaus on Resurrection Day, Jesus was explaining passage after passage after passage after passage that explained himself to them. That's what Paul is talking about right here. That God had promised before this gospel through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It's interesting in that passage in Luke chapter 24, it says, did not our hearts burn within us? as he explained the scriptures. In other words, things were just clicking. You know how it happens when you are are getting it, when it's starting to make sense to you, your heart just jumps for joy. That's what was happening on the road to Emmaus. That's what Paul is referring to right here. He says the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. Isaiah the prophet referred to these realities as good tidings or good news. The gospel then contains the fulfillment of those promises. And good news like that calls for celebration. Now, secondly, the gospel contains a description of the believer's new identity. Look in verses 6 and 7. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. Now, we all need this because we all struggle with this to one extent or another. We wrestle with who we are, with our role, with our place, with our impact, with our value. What if the government refers to you as non-essential? What if you're a mom at home right now? dealing with children and schooling and all sorts of things, and maybe you've had to set some of your own dreams on hold to deal with our current circumstances. Maybe you're unemployed. You struggle every day just to find something to do. You can only do so much Netflix. What are you supposed to be doing? Who are you anyway? What if you're not out changing the world, living life at a whole new level in passionate and radical pursuit of all you have dreamed you could be? I mean, what good are you anyway? And if you add to your own disappointments about who you are, those that people layer on top of that, (laughs) it's crushing. When people have in your past said that you're useless or you'll never amount to anything and then maybe in your current day right now you actually feel like you are useless and you're not amounting to anything, I mean, that's crushing. It's, it's, it's a desperate longing in the human heart to have a sense of identity and purpose, to understand who we really are. Now, the gospel contains the truth about this. And I hope you'll receive this today as from the word of God. The first thing it says that you are is called. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are called. What does that mean? It means you've been picked. It means that you've been sought. It means that you have been chosen. 
It means that you are desired by the king. It means that God made earnest pursuit of you. He didn't just say, oh yeah, well, okay, I'll, I'll take that one. No, he came looking for you. That's what the word called means. It means he came after you. He came looking for you. He wants you. If you have received him, if you have believed in him, there's another word here that Paul uses to identify the believers, beloved, in verse number seven. Who are you? You're called. Secondly, you are beloved. The word means dearly loved. And get this. Now let this just sink in for a minute. Since you are in Christ, you are loved as Christ is loved. You are loved as Christ is loved. Remember in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus spoke from heaven at the baptism of Jesus, and he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This text has exactly the same word. You too are beloved. You say, oh, no, Pastor, I've had such a rotten week. I've been such a rotten person. I've been such a disappointment to myself and to other people. Stop it. Stop it now. You are the beloved of God, dearly loved child of the Most High God. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, how about this word? Verse 7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God called saints. Now, we joke about this periodically, but this is what the Scripture teaches. This is, this is the identity of the believer. You are loved deeply by God. You are called by God. And you are a saint. No wonder God expressed his blessing through Paul to them in this particular passage. Notice what it says. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God desires this for his people, this grace, this peace. Now let me remind you that you are not called a saint because you always act saintly. I know many of you. I know you do not always act saintly. I have grandchildren that are saved, that are believers, that are called and dearly loved, who are also saints, who do not always act saintly. But you are not called a saint because you act saintly. You are referred to as a saint because God made you holy in Christ. When you were baptized into the body of Jesus, you took on a whole new identity. You were placed into Christ, and in Christ you are holy, set apart to be the kind of person that God designed you to be. Now, do you know what the word saint means? It doesn't mean a statue set up someplace. It doesn't mean somebody in a picture who's got a halo over their head. The word saint means awe-inspiring. <laughs> It means consecrated. It means holy. It means spectacular. There you are this morning. Some of you probably have bed head. You know, you slept well and it's all off on one side. You might still be in your pajamas this morning. Sipping coffee because you're trying to still get the sleep out of your eyes. You probably got your feet up, some of you, and your lazy boy or on an ottoman. Some of you might even have bunny slippers on this morning. And you know what you are? A saint. <laughs> Spectacular. Beautiful. Awe-inspiring. The gospel, you see, contains a description of the believer's new identity. Now, verses 8 through 13, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but I do want to point out verse number 12 because it's so fitting for where we are right now. Paul is writing to them. He's heard a lot about them. He knew a few of them, and he said, I just want to come and see you so bad. I just want to be with you. 
Why? I long to see you, he says. I want to give you some spiritual food that you might be established and built up. That is, that I might be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. That's what we miss when we're not together. It's that stirring up of mutual faith and encouragement. And I'm trusting and praying that we'll be together before too long, that we might have what Paul longed for here in verse number 12, that we'll might, we might enjoy that together. The gospel it contains a third thing in this particular text. Let us see a universal invitation. Paul wanted to get to Rome because he wanted to get the gospel to all kinds of people. Because the gospel contains a universal invitation. Notice what he says. I'm debtor both to Greeks and barbarians, to wise and to unwise. What does he mean by that? He means he, he owes it to them. He owes it to all kinds of people to share the gospel with them because the gospel is a universal invitation to all kinds of people. And Paul felt a debt. He felt an obligation. He felt that because of what God had done for him and called him to do that he had an obligation to share this blessing with all kinds of people. Now you notice here he mentions Jews and Gentiles in verse 13. And then he talks about Greeks uh, and wise people, intellectual people, cultured people. And then he talked about barbarians, uncultured and unwise, people without a whole lot of education. The gospel proclamation includes an invitation to all kinds of people. Now, that would include those people. You know what I mean? Those people. You have people that you consider to be those people. And what may not have occurred to you recently is that those people probably consider you to be those people people. You got that? Those people. Now, I am sure that there are people who consider me, for example, to be an unwise barbarian. I'm probably not considered woke. If you don't know what that means, then you are obviously not woke. I'm a baby boomer, okay? (laughs) I'm a white, middle-class male that drives an SUV. I hunt animals and eat them. What could possibly be more barbaric than that? According to some people, Men like me are responsible for everything from slavery to global warming. I'm one of those people. And guess what? The loving God and the good God sought me and has invited me to himself through Jesus Christ, our Lord. (laughs) If you were sitting in here right now, I'd say, can you say amen? Amen. And I hope you'll say it at home. God has invited us to himself. And he has invited those people. Because the gospel includes a universal invitation to all kinds of people. An invitation to forgiveness, to salvation, to eternal life, to heaven. An invitation to us people and to those people, whomever those people may be. Because here's the thing. His heart is big enough for all of us. Man, big enough for all of us. This is good news. Fourthly, the gospel contains the power 
of God. Look at verse 16. Paul says, and I am, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel contains the power of God. Now, how does the gospel contain the power of God? Well, you could say it this way. The truth of the proclamation is the effective means to bring salvation to anyone who believes. Now, I realize I didn't say that just like the text, but that's what the text means. Let me try that one more time. The truth of the proclamation is the effective means to bring salvation to anyone who believes. Now, if you don't like the way I said it, this is the way F.F. Bruce said it, quote, It is the message that reveals God's way of putting people right with himself, unquote. God's message, the message that reveals God's way of putting people right with himself. In other words, we don't need another one. We don't need a different one. We don't need a watered down one. We don't need to dilute the one we have. The gospel message is the power of God. Its truth is effective to bring salvation to anybody who believes. Now, it's not a man-made message. This is a message that came from God. We wouldn't have come up with one like this. If it was left to committee, (laughs) no way. If it was left to the Jews, no way. If it was left to the Gentiles, no way. This is a God-given message. But that does not mean that it's illogical or irrational. In fact, the longer I'm around the gospel, the more logical and rational I find it to be. I mean, what could be more obvious than that we are broken people in need? What could be more obvious when you look around the universe that there's a God? What could be more obvious that we need him? And when you consider historically the prophets, the message of the gospel in the New Testament, the the way the last 2,000 years have played out, what could be more logical and more rational than this? That God has made a marvelous way for us to be right with him and to have life in him, both now and forevermore. It really makes a lot of sense when you just stop your overthinking it and receive what God has said. Now, the reason it's hard to accept is because, as Pastor Ironside wrote, and I quote, it sets man aside in order that Christ alone may be exalted, unquote. As humans, we are fallen and broken and innately proud. We, we, we want to handle this on our own. We want to do this our own way. We want to fix it ourselves. One of the reasons that the gospel proclamation is so hard to accept is because it puts man down and it puts Christ up. It says, I have a need. Oh, Lord, I need you. And that Christ is the solution. Paul said in another place to the church at Ephesus that the salvation that we have is by faith, through grace, and not of works, lest any man should boast. We are never going to have an occasion where we can boast about how we became right with God. It is the power of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. As one song says, I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, but he gives new life to me. Boy, that's good news. And that takes a lot of pressure off of us as we think about eternity. Now, there's one last thing here that we'll look at, and that is the righteousness of God, verse number 17. Let me read these two verses together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just or the justified shall live by faith. The righteousness of God. The gospel contains the righteousness of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, righteousness is kind of a big Bible word. Sometimes people lose themselves in it. It basically means right. 
the rightness of God. In the gospel, the whole gospel, the rightness of God is revealed, that he is just, that he is good, that he is consistent. The just one made a way to justify the unjust. <laughs> or you could say, the righteous one made a way to righteify, I just made that word up, the unrighteous. The one who is always in the right made a way for those of us who are in the wrong to be made right. How? Through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. By faith unto faith. You notice it says in verse 17, from faith to faith. You could also translate that by faith unto faith. There's a an equivalent to that statement, by the way, in the Gospels. In John chapter 20, verse 31, John the Apostle said, or he wrote rather, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Believe, believing. An initial act of faith, an ongoing life of faith. The just shall live by faith. Eternal life is about faith to faith to faith. It starts in faith. It's lived in faith. Faith to faith. Out of faith. Into faith. Ongoing faith. Believe and believing. And it results in life. The text in the Old Testament says, The just shall live by faith. The justified, that is those who have believed, will live by faith. The ongoing faith is evidence of the one-time faith. Sometimes we talk about who's saved and who's not. We talk about, you know, can, can a person pray a prayer and then, you know, and then, and then be lost? And all. You know, there's a lot of mystery involved in all of that, and I'm just going to confess I don't understand how it all works. Here's, here's what's very clear to me. That if you actually believed in Jesus, the evidence of that is ongoing belief in Jesus. If you actually became a Christian, if you actually received the Holy Spirit, if you actually have come to Christ and believed, there's going to be an ongoing sense of belief. Believe and keep believing. Faith to faith. Believers are justified by faith, and then believers find life now by living by faith, by believing God. The same way to live the Christian life is the same way you started the Christian life. By faith. Now, there's a lot of examples of this. I'm just going to give you one that I think suits our time right now. Diane has um, a lot of appreciation for Max Lucado and listened to a book called Be Anxious for Nothing. And she knows that I struggle with anxiety, and so she invited me. I'm talking about my wife now, in case any of you are wondering who I'm talking about. Diane is my wife. And she invited me to just sit down one night and to watch Max Lucado read five chapters of his book, Be Anxious for Nothing. One of the phrases that really captured my attention was this. It is not the will of God for you to live in a state of perpetual anxiety. Did you get that? It is not the will of God for you to live in a state of perpetual anxiety. Max Lucado takes you to Philippians chapter 4. And just the way he puts it together is very good. He, he ties two verses together that are broken in the text by a verse break. And he puts it this way. The Lord is at hand, be anxious for nothing. The Lord is with you. The Lord is present. Stop worrying. The Lord is at hand, be anxious for nothing. Now here's the question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? You say, well, I'm a Christian. I, I got saved when I was six. You know, I, I believed in Jesus. I believed he died on the cross and rose from the dead, and, 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 and I put my faith in him, and I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That is not my question. My question is, do you believe that the Lord is at hand? Do you believe he's present? Do you believe he's with us? 
That's the cure to anxiety and the cure to life, because I'll tell you what, you can live a long, miserable life on your path to heaven, or you can live eternal life. The gospel includes the whole message. Do you believe that Jesus is with us? Are you anxious? You don't have to live in a state of perpetual anxiety. It's not the will of God for you. Now, we all have momentary anxiety. I'm not asking you that. But if you're living in perpetual anxiety, that is not the will of God. Paul gives a prescription to the Philippian church on this whole subject, and he says that you should start with worship. You should get God big in your head again. Because if you're living in a state of perpetual anxiety, your God is small or distant or gone. Worship restores God to his rightful place in our minds and in our hearts. And then the text goes on in Philippians chapter 4 to say, make specific requests to God with thanksgiving. So start thanking God for all the ways that he has provided for you. Start thanking God for all the ways that he's protected you. Start thanking God for all the things that he's done throughout your whole life. And then make specific requests to him and then leave them there. Leave them there and put them there until the peace of God guards your heart. And then the text says, and think on these things then. True things, noble things, just things. Meditate on them. The reason we live in a state of perpetual anxiety is because we meditate on the wrong things. Philippians 4.8 says, think on these things. Meditate on these things. And the peace of God will guard your heart. It will keep you. The God of peace will be with you. Do you believe that? I'm not saying you've got to be perfectly calm to go to heaven. Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead to secure your place in heaven. Believe it. But if that's all you ever believe, you're going to have a long, miserable path on your way to glory. You do not have to live in a state of perpetual anxiety. The God of peace will be with you, but it requires that we believe his word. And all of that is wrapped up in the gospel. God is right. The gospel reveals the rightness of God, the truth of God, the preciousness of God, the provision of God. And it reveals that he has made a way to life, but it requires faith. Faith beginning, faith all the way to the end. Faith to faith, because the just, the justified, live by faith. So to wrap up, the gospel contains all the ingredients you need for life now and forevermore. The gospel contains all all the ingredients you need for life now and forevermore. No wonder Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. What's the word of his grace? It's the gospel. I commend you to God and the gospel. They needed the gospel. And Rome needed the gospel. And you need the gospel. The good news that the Father has provided new life in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Receive it. Live it. That's the prescription. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us. Help us to take this prescription and appreciate it and love it and be gospel people, gospel-minded, Help us to realize the the depth and height and breadth and width of the gospel. That it really contains everything we need for life and godliness. And Lord, I pray that as we survey this letter, we'll provide enough of a framework that your people can lay a hold of these truths and live eternal life now on their way to their permanent home. So Lord, I especially pray for those that might be anxious right now, that are struggling with this state of perpetual anxiety. God, take them to Philippians 4, help them to live in it, soak in it, pray it, breathe it, live it, until they begin to know the promise of that text. That certainly is part of eternal life. 
And Father, I pray for all of us during these days that we will regularly worship, give thanks, and make our requests known to you. For you are a good God, you are right, you are righteous. And we commit ourselves to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, the God of peace be with you all. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Good morning. So today's story is about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And so I thought it'd be kind of funny to be here on a rock. So the thing is, is that I have, after being out here, I've realized that who knows what the weather was like. I mean, it, it's Israel, so it's not as like crazy as Michigan, but it could have rained. It could have been really windy like this. It could have been cold a little bit at night, but he was out there because the spirit led him there. It says that right after he was baptized, that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And then he was tempted. It says that um, for 40 days he was tempted. And it, it even says that it was in every way. So I wanted to read you something from Luke. It says, um, Luke 4, 13, it says, When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. So that means that Jesus was tempted in every way. And then there's another verse in Hebrews 4, which is very interesting. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And, and that's the big point, too. So the Spirit led him into the wilderness. He was tempted in every way that we are. Tempted to lie, tempted to be mean. Um, and then he did it without sin though. So like he was tempted and then he said, no, he was able to say no. And so then it really sparked in my head that you remember the Lord's prayer. It's the one that, um, most of you have memorized where it says, you know, um, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay. So if we fast forward a little bit, there's a part in there where Jesus said, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And I was thinking, I was like, this is personal. When Jesus taught you how to pray, it's because he was led to be tempted and he doesn't want us to be. See, he does things for us so that we know how to do it. So he told us, this is how you pray. Now, another thing you're gonna notice when you hear the story of Jesus being tempted, the way he said no was through the Bible. So the thing is, is that we have the Bible right here. So you're tempted to be mean to your family. They're ticking you off today. <laughs> but it says to be kind hearted, to be kind, tender hearted. So I was thinking that this week, find a couple verses in the Bible, like look through and just be like, okay, God, I want a couple verses that will help me this week. Um, good ones are in Romans. Um, we're doing Romans eight is a gather good one. Um, you know, Ephesians get beyond like John three sixteen. but these are words that you've hidden in your heart. So you won't sin against God. And that's, that's the point. Like being tempted means that you want to say no to God, but actually we want to say no to things that take us away from God. So I'm going to pray that this week you find verses that will help you to be kind, to be loving, but most of all, to love Jesus and to say yes to him.